What is fun fundamental actually is that people receive information. Access to information is a fundamental right. What can Europe do to keep independent media alive in and around Ukraine? Gushe Sommer. We've been following the developments in Ukraine ever since it started and now it has escalated. Our emergency team has been working round the clock to support the, the much needed um, support that the journalists need in and around Ukraine. But you, as a policy and advocacy officer, you work differently. Could you please tell us um, how you've responded to this crisis and what was your focus on? Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's true that we work differently from the project team, so to say. So I think what our main task is, is to um, bring the the needs um, of the people on the ground, in this case, uh, local uh, journalists in and around Ukraine, to bring their messages uh, to the public, to the politicians and to the policymakers uh, in the Netherlands and in the European Union. What we've been doing, for instance, is we've been speaking with the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We've been informing them on what's happening on the ground. We've also been seeking for um, uh, some sort of collaboration task force with them. Uh, we have been informing the Dutch members of parliament uh, because we have had some um, debates on Ukraine, of course, like I think in all European uh, member states um, have, has happened. Uh, so we try to inform them. Um, but also we've been involved in the uh, Media Lifeline um, project, um, the coalition um, um, for Ukraine to uh, promote the uh, protection of journalists and to make sure that media can um, well keep operating as much as possible in this war. And we have with us uh, today via Zoom, uh, Maria Sadowska Komlac. She's the team leader of Europe and Central Asia. Maria, welcome. You've been coordinating, um, <laughs> you've been coordinating the crisis in Belarus for a while. This is also your country of origin. You have been in this field for a very long time. The most pressing issue before Russia invaded Ukraine was that of the crisis in Belarus. Now, my question to you, um, do you feel like you're jumping from one crisis to the other? Or do you think that this is a crisis which is a part of a bigger crisis? I always correct uh, journalists who ask me about uh, the start of the war, that actually the war started back in 2014 with Russia's annexation of Crimea and later parts of Ukraine being under the control of Russia-backed forces. So what we see now is not a new invasion or not a new crisis at all. It's the consequence of the short attention span that many European and transatlantic leaders and media had. We people who are uh, from that region, Eastern Europeans or journalists who work with Eastern Europe, we're always on alert. We're always trying to say that actually the ambitions of the Russian governments were much bigger. The whole invasion of uh, informational fakes, disinformation, attempts to really destabilize the informational sphere around Ukraine have not stopped in 2014. In fact, they just started and there had been so many fake news and disinformation going around in the European Union, in the countries around Ukraine about what was going on, that it was clear that something was in preparation. So yes, this is part of a bigger crisis. On the one hand, it is a crisis of the Russian government thinking that it can afford invading countries around it. But on the other hand, it's a crisis of diplomacy, crisis of strategic response of the West to the threat that has been there near our door all this time. And thank you for the right correction that uh, this, this issue is not, not new, not from this year, dates back to 2014 and much before that. My next question to you is, do you find any similarities between the emergency work that you do now and what you've been doing in Belarus? Do you think you've gained some knowledge along the way that now perhaps helps you and your emergency work and your team? The emergency work is perfectly handled by Yantin, uh, our colleague and her team, 
we're just helping them from time to time. However, what we continue doing is looking for structural solutions that would outlive the current very urgent uh, moment where also the whole world's attention is turned to Ukraine. We understand that this world's attention will be gone in a couple of months, maybe a little bit longer, but that the real problems for the media and journalists would only start. So for many years, we had worked with partners inside Belarus, inside Ukraine, but also in countries around Belarus, Ukraine, or other countries in the region, helping to actually correctly report on what's going on, tell the stories, tell human stories, help each other with different type of uh, audience engagement uh, strategies, business models exchange. And all these ties, all this networking, between our partners, this is actually what is helping us to very quickly react on very specific needs of Ukrainian media right now. We get this information not because we just write to them and ask, what do you need? But because we're in daily contact and because we're also able to compare not only to Belarus, but to the situation when Nagorno-Karabakh happened in the 2020 or to some other situations in the region that let us learn. And I think this is also the lesson for all of us, not to single out a single country just because it's so fashionable, but to always see what can we learn from other crises around the region or even around the globe. I'm uh, quickly going to um, turn to Gusha now. Why is it important that independent journalism receives support? Well, I think we should look at the people on the ground in Ukraine. And what is really important, what is fun fundamental actually, is that people receive information. Access to information is a fundamental right because people need information in order to be able to uh, make well-informed decisions um, about their lives. And of course, in this war, uh, that becomes very relative. I realize that um, because people lose, um, well, control over their lives. But, but you do need information, for instance, uh, in order to decide on escape routes. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why information is very, very important. And that's why we need to support uh, Ukrainian or press in and around Ukraine as well. But also, if you look at the aftermath, um, it's very important that um, the current developments in the war and that the human rights violations that are taking place, that they are, that they are being documented. Uh, because if we want to achieve accountability afterwards, if we want to hold the, in this case, Russian uh, forces uh, accountable, uh, we need to document that. Um, and finally, I think um, what we see in this war is that it's being, it's extra complicated because of the nuclear threat. Um, of course, that's like, well, hanging above us um, and also external state uh, actors that don't perhaps want to get involved because of that nuclear threat. But we also have an information war that's going on. Mm -hmm. And I think what can be a very peaceful um, um, resistance to that information war is to support um, the information lifeline in and around Ukraine. So it's a, uh, it's perhaps the strongest weapon that uh, states can or will use mm -hmm. at this stage. Yeah. And uh, what do you think, uh, what do we as Free Press Unlimited think that the European Union should do to keep um, independent media alive and so to ensure that the flow of information is, is there? Yeah. Well, I think, first of all, financial support is very, very important. Um, we need to make sure that the press in and around Ukraine can continue um, their work as much as possible in these very difficult circumstances. Uh, one example of what um, EU member states can do is support the media hubs in and around Ukraine, where um, journalists, uh, maybe Maria can talk about that more, but where um, journalists um, are uh, provided with perhaps a shelter or VPNs or other technical facilities. Uh, they are brought together and um, they can there try to continue their work as much as possible. And these media hubs, hubs really need support. Um, finally, what's important um, is the uh, emergency visas. This is based on an idea of the high level panel of legal experts on media freedom. They have actually way before this war um, 
uh, started uh, already opted for emergency visas um, for journalists who are in life-threatening danger. In this case, uh, in the case of Ukraine, we see that there are visa waivers for uh, Ukrainian nationals, so also for Ukrainian journalists. Uh, this means that they can enter the EU and they can um, find shelter here. For non-Ukrainian journalists, like for instance, Belarusian journalists, but also Russian journalists who are in grave danger, there is no such visa waiver. I'm quickly going to turn to Maria. Do you have anything to add uh, to what Gush you said? Do you agree? I do agree that uh, journalism is important. However, I think uh, what the Kremlin is always trying to say is indeed that journalism is a part of the informational war, and it wants to always present the work of journalists and media as if they were some puppets of the West and would just be communicating things. Well, frankly, I don't want journalism to be part of the informational war. I want journalism to serve its function. Even now we can see that some media in Ukraine criticized President Zelensky for certain statements or ideas about Ukraine's future. Even now we see that some media are questioning the efficiency of certain Western approaches or even the corruption schemes on the border, which already appeared when people are trying to leave Ukraine. So we need to look at this problem in a complex and support good journalism for the sake of Ukraine, but also making sure that journalists continue doing what they do best, being, being above the different war lines. What do you think we as Europe, as the European Union, should do to move forward? What, what is there from now on? How do we go ahead? Um, I think two things are really important. First of all, for us as citizens, European citizens, Dutch citizens, um, it's very important that we keep pressuring our governments, that we keep showing that we, um, that we want our governments to do more um, against the Russian uh, war against Ukraine. Um, because that does make a difference. Uh, I think that's very important. And secondly, if people um, who are watching, for instance, want to support um, the information lifeline on the ground, um, we have the media lifeline, as we just discussed, discussed, where everything that we just discussed kind of comes together. So um, I think support for independent journalism is extremely important. And one way to support that is through the media lifeline. Media lifeline Ukraine. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, Maria, any closing thoughts? My closing thought would be uh, to stay indifferent, non-indifferent as much as possible, because then uh, it means also to the governments. What we saw with Belarus, the same governments that were really praising the activists and journalists and refugees from Belarus are now stopping issuing them visas or blocking their bank accounts just because they belong to a wrong uh, government governed country. So we should not allow the same to happen with the Ukrainian con uh, crisis. Let's continue being really engaged and support journalists in Ukraine. Thank you both very much. Thank you for joining us. This was Studio Free Press Matters. See you next time. Bye.